I think everybody's pretty much here. Maybe we can sit down and get started. So I'm Melba Crawford. I'm here. I have the pleasure of actually being able to introduce Dave, who's giving uh, the presentation today. And for those of you that may not have come to any of these celebrations uh, previously, then uh, let me just give you a little bit of background. So the celebration of faculty careers came out of a couple of things associated with the strategic plan. And one of them was actually <clears throat> the faculty of 2020, is what they call it, and that uh, focuses on professional development throughout one's entire career. And the other was the alignment, you know, as we're hiring people, of criteria and processes for not only the hiring and the promotion, but mentoring and development of careers throughout one's uh, entire professional life here. So as part of that, there was um, interest in doing a post-promotion so-called review, uh, which we really call a celebration here, after one achieves the level of full professor. And so the goal is to not only share our accomplishments as we got up to that point in time, but also to look to the future. And so that's uh, what makes it also so interesting because many times we find out things that we actually had no idea that people had planned for the future. This started in 2013 with a pilot and then was fully implemented in the next year. So, as I said, David Meyer is our speaker today and uh, he's been uh, here in electrical engineering for some period of time. Graduated in 73 uh, with a BS and then got an MS in uh, 75 and a second MS in computer science in 79 and a PhD in 81. So I was hoping some students would be here so they could see you know, how quickly faculty you know, progressed previously. Anyway, all of these were from Purdue and in 82 he joined the faculty and the School of Electrical Engineering at Purdue and he specializes in engineering education research, digital systems and electroacoustics. So I'll let Dave take it from here. All right. <clears throat> well, and first of all, thank you for coming today. And um, this is almost as much for me as it is for you <laughs> uh, in the sense of trying to work through some of the difficulties and the tragedies of the last uh, year or so ago. And um, I know there have been a lot of questions and perhaps not, enough, not very much information uh, presented on that. And so I wanted to use this opportunity to not only fulfill the requirements of the post-tenure review, but also to um, share exactly what happened and uh, maybe give you some insight and give you the opportunity to ask some questions about the tragedy involving uh, Andrew Bolt. <clears throat> and uh, I will try my best to get through this. Um, uh, <laughs> my, my rehearsals haven't gone so well, so uh, we'll see what we can do. But uh, I appreciate your patience as uh, I attempt to get through this. So my outline is, uh, I'm going to kind of segue back and forth, if you will. Um, I'm actually going to start with one of the hardest episodes, that around January 21st of 2014. But then I'm going to transition into the academic stuff and go over um, uh, my history in terms of what I've done. Um, some of the consulting opportunities that I've had and how that's influenced my teaching and research. Um, uh, give you a, a snapshot of where some of my PhD students are now. Um, then get into significant accomplishments. Um, so hopefully that will be of some interest. And then maybe hopefully the most informative part will be, I'm gonna share what I've learned along the way, sort of academically, especially as it refers to or applies to teaching. Um, so I'll be interested to see what you think about those comments. And then I'm going to skip back to the follow-up on the tragedy, namely the sentence hearing, and then have some concluding thoughts. And I'll try not to bloviate too long because I, as my students well know, I can get going on a topic and uh, not be brief. So I, somebody throw something at me. My dear wife Marcia is here, so she's going to keep me in line. Okay. So let me walk you back to January 21st, 2014. Uh, we all remember that winter, and that morning was another snowy commute. Uh, we had been off for um, uh, Martin Luther King Day. We're just a week into the semester, and 
you know, not a whole lot happens in our labs, uh, undergraduate labs in particular, in the first week, just organizational meetings. So we're just starting the first lab sessions. Um, at about 11.15 that morning, uh, Joe Buehler and I were standing in the exact spot, basically, where the incident occurred. I had come down to lab to uh, check how the first lab division had gone to see if everything was going well, and uh, he filled me in on everything. Went back to my office to uh, I think I was working on homework or something at that point. Um, then at 11.35, the second lab division had just started, and I got a co phone call from Andrew Bolt. He's inquiring whether uh, what references should be used for the quiz because we're having our first lab quiz that week. Uh, just very brief call, uh, and of course that was the last time I talked to him. Then at 12:02, well, I hope I can get through this. <clears throat> this is way too early to break up. Um, I got a frantic phone call from the other TA assigned to that division. Tim Triple is his name, and he was on the run, uh, basically, um, saying that told me that Andrew had been shot, and. Uh, was basically running for his life. I asked him if he was okay, and then I proceeded to try to get over to the W building, but at that point, the sirens were going off, the police were on their way, and I knew it was useless to go over there, so I just went back to the shelter in place command to stay in my office. Uh, around two o'clock or so, I believe it was, Todd Wild came up to my office and told me that Andrew was in, had indeed passed. Um, and around three o'clock, um, several individuals came over to get me to go over and look at a video of the incident to identify Andrew. Uh, and around six o'clock that evening, I realized there was nothing else I could do, um, went home. And then um, that evening, a detective came out to interview me. Um, Actually, an exponent reporter was pounding on our door. We live way out in the sticks, and it's kind of strange. And basically, all day warding off phone calls. Uh, so, those are one of those. This is one of those days that doesn't exactly fit your job description. But perhaps even more difficult. Of course, Purdue was off Wednesday, the twenty-second. Um, Andrew's parents wanted to meet with me. I had never met them before, and um, so I was sitting in this little room over the at the union waiting for them to come by for what seemed like an eternity. And um, the one quote that's sort of seared in my mind is his dad said, you know, if everyone liked Andrew so much, why did somebody want to kill him? And of course, I had no answer at the time, but now I do. But um, at the time, that was a very hard question. Okay. Then uh, on Friday uh, the 24th, President Daniels had been out of the country and came back, and he wanted to meet with me as well as the TAs. That was a very wonderful gesture on his part. And we were actually in this room sitting around in a big circle. And so <clears throat> got to my office, and the very first thing he asked me, somewhat curiously, is how did a troubled individual like Cody get hired as a teaching assistant, which kind of took me off guard. I'm thinking, okay, well, how would I know not to hire him, right? Because he got an A in the course previous semester. Um, his professor had recommended him, and the TA that he had recommended him as well, okay? Um, we had obviously no access to records at CAPS or any other entity that might have information about his troubled past. Okay, and then Saturday and Sunday, um, a lot of turmoil. Um, you can see my scribbles, um, <clears throat> but I knew I had to do something to help comfort the parents, because um, so I just started scribbling. <clears throat> I know many of you have read uh, this. Uh, essay, so I won't belabor it too much, but um, I just started out by pointing out 
why one of the reasons, or some of the reasons, that Drew was so near and dear to me is his mom always called him Drew, so that's why Drew's used in here, uh, is that um, he reminded me so much of my own sons, Corbin and Connor. Um, uh, Drew's uh, senior project team did a, 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 a quadcopter, a very wonderful project, and they actually finished early and helped other teams finish their projects. Uh, he was very much involved in the uh, carry quad racing team uh, with the go-karts. It reminded me of the one our kids made and rode around the neighborhood and literally knocked the wheels off of. Um, but uh, also his, I think what I would call his educational mission statement was exactly the same as mine. And just the sentence there, to help students learn and to have fun in the process. Okay. And that's why I think one of the awards that I've gotten that means the most to me is the Helping Students Learn Award, a university award, because that's what I would like to think I'm all about is helping students learn, and that was Drew's mission in life. And we also shared a, a, a penchant for academic honesty. He was zealous for that, and I appreciated his attention to that. Uh, and so, to just talking about how he, their team voluntarily helped others, and he would even come to help sessions with problems worked out to help other students that had come to those sessions. And the uh, scripture that, that, that I think um, best exemplifies him is um, the fact that, that we are God's workmanship. Um, and that means like a masterpiece or work of art. We're created to do good works, uh, which God's prepared in advance for us to do. And I think that was his mission in life. Um, he was, um, went to Catholic schools throughout his career, high school and uh, grade school. And um, this is an excerpt from the program at his funeral. Um, the prayer for generosity and, and this, I mean, he really lived his life according to this, okay? To, to be generous and to serve um, and to toil and not just seek rest. So <clears throat> that's, that's how he lived his life. And then the funeral was on January 28th and um, uh, President Daniels uh, graciously invited me to fly there with him along with three students and I really appreciate that because you know he could have loaded the plane with you know Purdue dignitaries but instead he chose me and three students uh, basically his senior design teammates and another individual and uh, so that was, and it was an extremely cold evening, as I recall. I was shivering all the way home after we flew back in. Uh, but that was obviously a very moving time. Okay, now we're gonna shift gears for a moment. We'll, we'll come back to this story. There's no way I could get through it all at once, and I appreciate your patience with me. But um, let me just go back and recap my uh, academic history, and we'll attempt to get through the post-tenure review don't have too many plans for the future because I'm 64, right? So I've got about a year left. So I guess the future part doesn't work out too well. But anyway, we'll, we'll say where we've been at least. So um, yeah, I first arrived on campus in 1969. There's probably no one in this room, well, is anybody in this room old enough to know that? But back in the day, do you remember the green beanies? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the freshmen had to wear green beanies around and. Uh, of course, the upperclassmen would try to steal them from me, so that was pretty amusing. Uh, I got my bachelor's in 1973, and um, actually took my first digital systems course in room 67. So my digital career started in room 67, and it ended there. Um, so, uh, and my first grad TA job was in that room as well as for 467. Of course, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was uh, a digital systems lab, and it was under the purview of uh, Professor Fred Mao, who was also my advisor, research advisor. 
And we were building, we called it the wall computer, nicknamed the molasses. So we're actually building all the little functional blocks of a computer that we now put in a programmable logic device in our labs now. But uh, that was my first project as a grad TA. Uh, the first lecture I taught was as a master's student during the summer. I didn't realize that nobody wanted to teach during the summer and I thought it would be fun. And so I taught the precursor to 270, uh, to 270 uh, which was the lecture part of that, uh, back in the summer of 1974, okay? So really kind of freaked students out when I said, well, you know, I've been teaching this course for 41 years. Um, so, but anyway, um, I got my uh, first master's in 75. We actually had a biomedical emphasis because I thought I wanted to work in that industry. And then at the last minute, for some reason, I thought, you know, I really think I want to try to teach. I would really like to do that. I've enjoyed doing that. And at the very last minute during the summer of 1975, I decided to continue on for a PhD. While I was working on my dissertation, I was actually starting to teach large lectures, okay? We're talking hundreds of students. And um, some of you may recall that that's when the double E enrollment peak occurred, somewhere we had like 1,300 students uh, at that point in time, so we had very large classes. Um, I had taken so many computer science courses along the way that I decided to go ahead and get a master's in computer science, and then uh, shortly after that, I finished my dissertation. Um, then I was uh, initially uh, a visiting assistant professor. Ben Coates was head at the time. And uh, I guess they thought they needed people that were willing to teach uh, large classes. Um, then I was hired on for tenure track and went on from there, okay? And uh, sort of, a, I, I feel very blessed to have had this job because with my record now, I don't think, uh, I mean, I'm on the hiring committee for people to replace me and, you know, I would never be on that list. I wouldn't even be on the first list. So uh, I'm very fortunate to have come in at the time that I did and had the opportunities that I have. So I'm very grateful for that, okay. Uh, I've had a series of consulting opportunities along the way. And I mentioned these because they've uh, significantly influenced my teaching as well as some of my research um, based on some early publications in um, uh, relative to my dissertation. Um, I was invited to work for both Electro Voice as well as AT&T Bell Laboratories, um, developing different things. And sort of the curious thing is I was describing this 3D loudspeaker directivity data acquisition system that uh, we had put in place in, elect in Electro Voice back in 1986. One of my students came up after class and said, um, we still have that system. I interned there this summer and it's still in use. So that was pretty amazing. Um, and um, I've also worked uh, as uh, in a consulting basis for Ada Kappa Nu as well as various law firms as expert witness. Um, and that has greatly informed my senior design teaching, uh, handling some of the, the professional skills related to product safety and patent liability. Uh, so that's been very valuable experience. And also had the opportunity to uh, spend a semester at Grove City College as a visiting professor there. I helped them with some of their ABET stuff. Uh, so that was a wonderful experience as well. Uh, just where a few of my PhD students are now, it's kind of interesting, spanning from the beginning to the end, so to speak. Uh, uh, Art and Tom are both professors. Um, uh, Art is actually the department head at Cal Poly. Um, Al Ruther is at MIT Lincoln Laboratories. Kujay is at IBM Systems and Technology Group in China, and Chris is uh, at MITRE and uh, a lead engineer there. And uh, skipping ahead to the guy that just recently got out the door, Jeff Turkstra, he's uh, at ITAP, but he would really like to teach. So he's sort of a modern day clone of me in terms of the desire to teach, I guess, okay. Now, uh, in terms of significant accomplishments, I always hate to use these superlatives, <coughs> I thought about taking the word significant off. These are just kind of accomplishments, things that I've done, spent my time doing. Uh, some of my initial research, and of course this is related to my dissertation, uh, was in acoustics and loudspeaker arrays. And I had some of the first publications on 3D simulation and visualization of loudspeaker directivity patterns, as well as proposing ways to create steerable loudspeaker arrays with programmable beamforming, okay? Now, the technology didn't exist back in the day when I wrote those papers, okay? There were, 
There were extremely simple microcontrollers. There weren't DSPs. There weren't Class D amplifier modules or anything like that that you need to do that. Okay. Um, but it did lead to those consulting opportunities that really taught me a lot. And the interesting thing is that 25 years later, these Envision loudspeakers are now available on the market. There are at least two companies that are making them. Uh, one of them is Meyer Sound, and I always joke in class, it's Meyer Sound, no relation. Uh, but that same concept that I was coming up, multiple beam, steerable loudspeaker arrays, line arrays, uh, has come into being. So that's kind of gratifying to see that happen, even though I wasn't involved with that product development. Uh, most of you know that I've been significantly involved in curriculum development, largely in the digital systems area, but also um, just for fun, I guess, if you, I guess if you like to teach, it's fun. I created audio engineering classes. Uh, so about seven or eight years ago, I decided, okay, I wanna spend the last few years here doing teaching stuff that's really fun in small classes, okay? Um, now I do enjoy teaching the large classes because I'm kind of a ham and like to have fun and stuff like that and make bad jokes and try to make people laugh. But um, this was an opportunity at uh, multiple levels to apply uh, my knowledge of audio engineering. And actually part of it was for selfish reasons because I wanted to learn more about audio and acoustics myself and this doing the courses actually gave me a good excuse to do that. So uh, an opportunity came along almost at about the same time to do these freshman seminar classes and I thought, well, what would be, and, and these are for like classes of size 30 and you wanna, they're, they're intended to be small classes where students can interact with a professor sort of one-on-one -on, -one at a, on a small class level. So I thought, okay, well, audio engineering is fun. I think I can do a, a week, week of class seminar on that and uh, the recent editions of it, we've had loudspeaker projects where they actually design and build a loudspeaker enclosure and then we have a competition at the end. And it's been a really, really good class. It's been fun to teach. And actually some of the freshmen that have gone through that class are now in my senior class on sound reinforcement system design. They're also doing loudspeaker enclosures that are a little more sophisticated now and uh, a sound system design project using commercial simulation software. Um, Unless you've been around a long time, you probably don't realize I was heavily involved in the graduate program and taught numerous classes on TV, namely 566 and 568. And with uh, my good friend George Wadica, we taught an electroacoustics seminar for a couple of years. Um, so um, have that experience as well. And I guess, uh, you know, maybe I'm best known as the a weapon of mass instruction because I typically teach three to four courses a year, uh, a semester, I should say. Um, <laughs> So um, it's, uh, yeah. Now, I'm, I'm sorry for all the information on this slide, but I just wanted to keep it to one slide. This is abuse of PowerPoint, I know I confess. But um, just in terms of what I've done in terms of engineering education research and instructional innovation, um, uh, one thing back in the day is uh, the department wanted to have their own course and instructor evaluation system, so I designed it along with the forms and all the software that did the processing. And we used that until the university took it over with their one size fits all system. Um, and then um, probably the key thing is the second bullet, trying to incorporate design in the curriculum. And I'd like to think that I played a pretty key role in the transition of our department from an ABET problem child back pre-2000 to now, from our recent visit, a poster child. And that's quite a transformation. Um, another thing is uh, trying to come up with alternate class formats that would help students learn. Uh, many of you are familiar now with the flip classroom, but what you may not realize is that the first ones were done here. We called it directed problem solving, and I used the word inverted for the class format, but um, we have like 10 years of trials in both 270 and 362 uh, that we have as data for some of the research that we've done. And then I've been heavily involved in online delivery of educational content, but of course everybody does that now. Um, we actually had one of the first online uh, grad courses that was offered at Purdue. Uh, the late Dave Ebert and I were the two that did it, and um, I did 566 online, so uh, have that uh, to note. And then the so-called, what I call the video jockey uh, multimedia instructional delivery system. The first version of it was actually a computer-controlled network of VCRs on an in-house cable TV network. So you could 
log into a Linux machine and pick the video that you wanted to play and tune to the right channel. And actually before that, I re would record my lectures and walk them over to Stewart Center and they would be on the Purdue channel. So if you happen to be unfortunate back in the 80s and turn on the Purdue channel at 5.30 in the morning, you would hear my lectures. Uh, so, um, and then uh, the second version was uh, a, a Windows NT server version running Starworks. But back in that time, computers weren't powerful enough to decode video, so you had to have separate video decoder cards. And so we had separate television monitors along with that, of course. A lot has transpired since then, but um, we have just recently uh, gotten the equipment I'm still in the process of deploying. It's all packed up in my office, much to my wife's chagrin. But uh, it's <laughs> uh, in boxes. Uh, the latest version of MediaSite, it's, it's a rich media capture system, which, is, which means it's a multi-viewpoint system um, in HD. So we're anxious to get that going and new production equipment, new cameras and everything. So that's where we are today. Um, and uh, I've been blessed to uh, uh, be acknowledged for different things. Um, like I said, the Helping Students Learn Award is probably the one, one of them that I prize the most. Um, just because that's what I feel like I'm about. But I've gotten several national awards, uh, a lot of the uh, local awards as well. So, uh, okay, so here's the good part. Well, I hope it's a good part. I hope you appreciate that. Um, I wanna just share my words of wisdom, or at least things that I believe, or maybe have learned, or maybe I'm still learning along the way, okay? Um, so, I tried to keep this as short as possible, and I kept adding them, and I finally realized I had to quit adding new things that, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, so uh, I just want to kind of summarize these. So there are some bullets, but I have some graphic examples of some of these things that I don't expect anybody to read. But um, I just want to share my uh, amassed uh, knowledge over the last 30 odd years or so. Okay. So the first one, and these are in no particular order. Okay because uh, some of the more important ones are towards the end. But I think structure is important. And really at all levels. Uh, students benefit from details in terms of policies and procedures, uh, well-defined expectations, regular homeworks, regular evaluations, and even things like calendars that show them when things are, what materials covered when, and when important events like exams, and, and so on, and what labs are being done, and, and so on down the line. So, I think structure is important, okay. Um, I need structure, <laughs> I guess that's right. Uh, another thing is that uh, one of the things we did as part of uh, participation in the Purdue Impact Pro Program, and I did this for both 270 as well as 362, is we had the opportunity to create a number of learning uh, uh, objectives that corresponded to the learning outcomes that we had already previously defined. These are based on Bloom's taxonomy of sort of action verbs. So it's a definitive list of things that they ought to be able to do after associated with each course outcome. And so in other words, it further delineates each course outcome. And I use the word, the old ABET word outcome to have to denote the higher level thing that you're supposed to be able to do, like the ability to program a microcontroller. And then under that are learning, specific learning objectives, things that they should be able to do under that particular category. So um, I think that's important as well. Um, another thing that's become readily apparent to me over the ages is that students have different learning styles. There's no one size fits all sort of optimum teaching size, uh, style. So it's really important to incorporate variety and active learning things in the classroom. And this was the genesis of our directed problem solving uh, exercise that we did here. And uh, Professor Brown Cordelia back there is, been my partner in crime in that for the last umpteen years, uh, however long it's been, almost all 10 years of the trials, yeah. Uh, and like I said, this is a precursor to the, what's popularly called now the flipped approach. Uh, but to try to get students into the right division, so we typically run two divisions in parallel, although this semester Cordelia's got all 260 students to herself. But um, we use an index of learning style survey and that it provides guidance to uh, students whether, as to whether they're better suited for a traditional lecture environment or the directed problem solving sort of inverted or flipped environment, okay? 
And we've written a number of papers on this. Okay. Um, try not to laugh at the picture. Students benefit from horizontally and vertically integrated lecture lab experiences. Let me explain what I mean by that. I'm a big believer in integrated lecture lab courses. Uh, and in fact, all the courses I've redone are like that, 273, 62, and 477, okay? But that would, I would call that the horizontal integration, okay? There's a lecture component and a lab component. In lecture, you can say, in lab this week, you're gonna do X. In, in lab, you can have the TAs say, in lecture last week, you covered this, okay? Go back and look at your notes. So it's uh, very tightly integrated together. Um, vertical integration is throughout the curriculum. So starting in 270 to 362 to 477, the chain I'm responsible for, um, that's the vertical integration of those experiences. And that together provides a pretty powerful combination uh, to help student learning. Um, also, I believe students benefit from regular continuous feedback. This is almost a, ca a Captain Obvious one. Um, in uh, both 270 as well as 362, Cordelia and I try to uh, make use of daily, almost daily clicker quizzes uh, for fine grain, you know, on the spot evaluation and, and go back to review points and lecture, whatever is needed to uh, address that. We have weekly lab quizzes in both of these courses, so the lab gives us the luxury of having a platform to do the quizzes. Um, exams for every course outcomes, so there might be four outcomes, or might be three outcomes, or whatever. So there's an exam for each one of those. And I try to give them a projected grade report that accurately um, shows them where they are in the class, and they really appreciate that. Uh, and it turns out that it's a pretty stable estimate of what's going on. So it's just based on the total weight that comes in. This is one of the final reports. So it's got these cryptic codes in them, but we give them a key to what the codes mean. But it tells them what their grade is and how close they are to the borderline and all their scores so they can check to make sure that we have the correct scores recorded for them. Um, and these are all tools that I wrote myself. Uh, they run under Linux, by the way. Um, students also appreciate attention given to and enforcement of academic integrity, especially on exams. Um, Especially in 270, we go to extreme lengths like assign seats and take attendance, label exams, check IDs as they turn in their exams. And we even provide pencils because now they have these camera pencils and stuff like that. So uh, we just try to avoid that. Uh, there's also an academic honesty statement, so you can see where we put the label. And of course, these are all automatically generated for us. But, um, uh, and then, of course, clearly spell out uh, our policy on professionalism as well as give examples of cheating. So that together provides a pretty powerful thing. Okay. Now I don't know if the, you'll all agree with the next one. I know there's some detractors in the crowd on this one, but use of PowerPoint does not need to be pointless, okay, or boring. Okay, you may already be bored, so this, I may have lost the battle on this one. But um, I've developed what I call a dual screen presentation format. And I try to use PowerPoint for what PowerPoint does best, like doing animations, I call them cheesy animations in class, uh, running video clips, uh, showing details of things. But at the same time, I give them what I call lecture summary notes. And these are all posted online, and you're welcome to look at them. They're all just uh, freely available on the course website. Uh, so we encourage them to have a printed copy of those lecture summary notes to facilitate note taking. So most of the stuff there, but in the margins, they can write uh, value added things I, I value added things that I add to uh, the lecture material, okay? So for example, we would show the animation of quantization um, for an A to D converter on PowerPoint, but in front of them, they would have the finished slides and um, would be able to refer to that, okay? So it minimizes their note-taking effort, but it also helps them to, to have well-organized notes, okay? And in fact, we let them use a, a, a soft copy of these lecture summary notes for exams. So they have that available as a reference. Again, here's a controversial one for some of you. And I must confess to start uh, at the outset here is that this represents a complete change in my thinking, okay? Because back in the day, I thought the only valid exams were write them out, work them out problems, grade them, partial credit, for those, some of those 270 exams and 362 exams, we would sit down with all the TAs in a room for an entire day, passing them around, grading them, stacks of two or 300 papers, okay? Uh, and then I realized, hmm, 
maybe there's another way to do this. Uh, and I got into it gradually uh, and then finally realized, I may be the last one to figure this out, that uh, our, the IDP services on campus are excellent. They're very good people to work with. Um, and uh, you can actually write really good multiple choice questions at a variety of different levels. I use them in all my classes from, from sophomore to senior classes, okay. Um, and maybe it's a sickness because I kind of like writing questions. Mm -hmm. I hate to admit that, but, uh, and seem, uh, <laughs> I've gotten reasonably good at it, I guess, okay. So uh, I actually, instead of using IDP, I just use them to scan the forms and they give me a CSV file and I have my own software that generates a bunch of files and grades and emails students results and generates histograms and all this other stuff. So for example, the student would get the report there on the right. This is from the last exam in exam three we just had in 270. It shows them which questions they got wrong. If there was a blank, there's a dash there, and it tells them what uh, the number of correct answers. The instructor gets a full spreadsheet showing all the response details, and so they can come in and go over their test. The instructor will know exactly what they answered on each question and can do that. Of course, there's an item analysis that's generated. And you can do a quick look at that to see if you've got an outlier question. You may need to toss a question. Um, and then, uh, so things like the histogram can be posted online to show students how they do this, okay. And um, the dirty little secret is that um, all these are all little command line programs that run under Linux. And uh, I can run all these results and, and generate all this information probably faster than you can log into Blackboard and open up the gradebook. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is uh, sort of the way to do it, I think, okay. And again, here's another controversial one, uh, but uh, I'm really a believer in what ABET has done recently, okay? And hear me out on this. Uh, the emphasis that they've made on design and outcome assessment has significantly improved engineering education, okay? And it's not just because I've written a book chapter on it and uh, several papers on it, um, I really think it does if we, you know, being forced to do our testing sort of outcome by outcome and we can even do that fine grain look at item analysis to see where students are having difficulties. But we can clearly see, you know, which outcomes students are having the most difficulty with, which ones they're doing better, what our overall rate is as far as uh, outcome fulfillment and so forth. Um, so I really think this has improved the engineering education way of life, okay? And again, you're welcome to disagree with me on that, okay? Now this is an old-fashioned one, okay? I'm old and old-fashioned, I guess. But I sincerely believe that students learn more when they have to write or type stuff out, okay? The first thing I tell students that, you know, they come to my office and say, you know, I'm really having trouble getting this, and uh, I say, I, I ask them how they are studying, so that's my first question. What are you doing to study? What is your procedure? Describe how you go about it. Give me your typical study day or whatever technique. And I just try to convince them, and I mention this over and over each semester, uh, you just can't learn much by looking at it. You can't learn by osmosis, okay? And, and especially for me, now some people might be able to do it better than me, but I have to write stuff out in order to get it. Uh, so class notes, and because the reason for it is because when you're writing something out, physically writing something out, you're actually in helping encode it in your brain. So there's an encoding process, process that goes on that's associated with that, and so that's why it's so important. And certainly, I'm, I'm into old-fashioned homework assignments where they fill them out. Uh, again, we have the luxury of having the labs. We have the lab TAs check them, along with the, you know, doing the quizzes and stuff. And of course, we have lab experiments where there's quite a bit of work to, to do, okay. Now, here's where I think one of my biggest contributions lies, and that is, and this is a thing that I really, really believe, and that is that student creativity and learning blossoms, literally blossoms, when challenged with open-ended, self-selected design experiences, okay. Now, that sentence has high overhead written all over it, doesn't it? <laughs> It's a lot of work, okay? Um, but um, I think it's worth it because this is where students really, really learn. Um, so the first place I started doing this was in the microcontroller course, ECE 362. Um, 
we have a so-called mini project at the end of the semester. It's supposed to be a two or at most three week project, okay? That thing sitting over there, that LED cube with the printed circuit board under it is one of the 362 mini projects from last semester. It does all kinds of LED display patterns. I'm not running it because you'd probably be watching that instead of listening to me, but um, uh, it's an incredible mini project. And you can see the creativity in these uh, snapshots, everything from games uh, to um, musical instruments to uh, hacked uh, hard drive clocks with um, RGB LEDs. Uh, we have a design showcase every semester uh, where they get to show their wares and we have a captive audience because we drag in the, uh, the sophomores from 270 and give them bonus credit for attending. And so we get all this interaction between the seniors and the juniors and the sophomores and it's just uh, really been a very, very good thing. Yes, it is a lot of work, but uh, you know, one <laughs> I gotta confess, one semester I decided, this was a long time ago, I decided, you know, this is too much work, I'm just gonna cancel, I'm, I'm gonna cancel the mini project this semester. I got so many complaints, I said, I'm never gonna do this again. I will always suck it up and do the mini project, all right? So, a um, uh, lot of activity. Uh, and this carries over then to senior design and I just, pick four representative posters here. Um, everything again from gaming devices like the Robo Rubik's Cube, uh, steerable loudspeaker array. Uh, Joe Land, interestingly enough, got the Eaton Award recently and also an IEEE Consumer Electronics Award for uh, a internet enabled uh, audiophile amplifier that he had designed uh, for a startup company in Indianapolis. And he's been here to speak uh, several times. Um, some students did a segue, so even though we're, me we're not mechanical engineers, we pretend to be. Uh, and then uh, another one is the um, incredible uh, HUD device, which is a heads-up display in a helmet. Uh, and these students actually went to the uh, Intel Challenge uh, uh, competition, national competition with that. So uh, that's 477. And I've carried this over into my... Uh, my uh, <coughs> audio classes that I, you know, I just do as overload just because they're fun. Um, again, we'll typically get 20 students or so, but this shows some of their creativity. So what they do with the software simulation tools, they pick all the equipment. Like I said, we've added a loudspeaker design project there this semester. And even the freshmen, okay. Uh, there's a snapshot of the freshmen from one of the uh, construction uh, uh, sessions that we had a couple years ago. Um, so uh, the freshmen have enjoyed this kind of experience as well. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's what makes it worthwhile, okay. Now, here's an opinion, okay. This is more of an opinion as opposed to what I learned. Uh, and this is maybe, maybe a suggestion, opinion, whatever, okay. And um, I thought Mitch Daniels, in his inaugural letter, I don't know how many of you read that, but I thought he did a really good job of outlining the challenges for future brick and mortar institutions, okay? Um, I think our future, okay, certainly will be strong in the research area, okay? That's a given. But what about undergraduate education, okay? Uh, you know, that we've got big competition out there with distance learning and online universities, so content delivery alone is not gonna cut it, okay? So if we just get up and stand in front of classes and, and, and deliver content, that can be done online much better, almost. Um, but what's really hard to do online is to have this highly integrated lecture lab stuff with expensive instrumentation, okay? In our undergraduate microcontroller lab, we have several thousand dollars worth of, of equipment per bench, per student, okay? Kind of hard to do at home that way, okay? And so we can design sophisticated experiments around that instrumentation, which is really hard. So we could have a stronger focus on that integration of lecture lab experiences throughout the undergraduate cur curriculum. I've already told you my belief in open-ended self-selected design projects, okay? At all levels, that's proven to be extremely effective. Uh, and perhaps consider, um, you know, I'm going out the door here soon, but uh, maybe to find people that are more interested or more in tune at least to, to doing this kind of development uh, to tap into the uh, faculty of engineering practice positions which have been uh, 
at least that position definition has been recently created. Okay. And this uh, last one here, <laughs> aren't you glad this is the last one? I should probably check my time, how am I doing? Okay. Um, uh, is, uh, we'll provide the segue into the, uh, the last part of this uh, uh, presentation, perhaps obviously, which I hope and pray I can get through. But um, I would like to think this is another one of my contributions is to uh, employ undergraduate teaching assistants in some of our large lab courses, uh, in particular the ones I've been responsible for, 270 and 362. Um, it's a fact that students in these, these basic courses where they're first learning to write code, at the sophomore level they're writing hardware description language code, at the uh, microcontroller level they're writing assembly code and C code, as well as designing circuits, they have lots of questions. Um, we found that we need at least seven or eight, uh, for every seven or eight students, that we need one TA, okay? It's, it's just a body count, basically, to be able to handle the volume of questions, okay? Well, the conventional approach is to staff only with grad TAs, um, but that can get expensive really fast. Uh, so if we staff with just a couple of supervisory GTAs, but predominantly with UTAs, we can provide twice as many contact hours to students as we could for less money, okay? And in fact, we save basically 50% of the cost doing this, okay? So, but it's not just for cost reduction because there are some actual, uh, there are some other benefits as well, okay? The UTAs have recently had a course and they know, and they've gotten a good grade in it and they can, hit the ground running. They know the material well and they can contribute, okay. Then the UTAs themselves end up learning the material better, okay. You just heard that today at the, the Murphy Award Lunch that it just came from that um, one of the recipients said, uh, wh whose son was a, a, a uh, undergraduate physics TA said, mom, I'm learning the material better, okay. That's exactly what we want to happen, okay. The best way to learn something is to teach it, okay. That's why created the audio courses because I wanted to learn more about acoustical engineering. Uh, and then they also perform better in post-requisite courses, like the follow-on courses. Um, we also uh, have the opportunity to let them take it as a course. So if they would rather get academic credit, you know, sometimes in the curriculum they're one or two credit hours short, we can accommodate that by having them do some extra course development work like testing new experiments or whatever as part of their duties. And then finally, they get an opportunity to interact closely with uh, several professors, and that provides a great avenue for obtaining job and grad school references. As probably as Matt will tell you, Matt Golden will tell you, is I probably write more grad school recommendations than anybody else on the faculty. So uh, it's one of the, I guess, benefits of doing that. All right. So sounds great, doesn't it? Okay. But now we transition back to dealing with unspeakable tragedy. Um, you may not realize this from all the, what appeared in the popular press, but uh, you know, Andrew was certainly a brilliant student. He got an A plus student in senior design, but he didn't start out that way. He was actually on the bubble for his first application in 270. Uh, and here's, I guess this email proves that I, I, I uh, archive more emails than Hillary, but um, this is from <laughs> May of 2012. Uh, but I actually found this email where he had asked me about, because I'd already done preliminary assignments, and um, he wasn't on the list and was asking about it. He said, you know, I'll do DPS, I'll do whatever. And I finally worked him into the lab, and um, uh, the rest of the story is he just blossomed, okay? So he learned the material better, 362. He got a better grade than in 270. Uh, of course, by the time he was in senior design, he was one of our best students, okay? So it really, really does play out that way, okay? So I just want to point that out. And then, you know, a couple months before his passing, he'd asked me to write a grad school recommendation for him, you know, one of the many that I'd done. And uh, I'm not, I'm not going to read all this to you, but it just it's very touching to see his desire to go to grad school, but to continue to work at the company that had offered him a job, John Deere. He had worked there during the summer, and he wanted to continue doing that. But he wanted to be even better and go to grad school to learn some of that. Uh, and uh, 
And it's just a tragedy that he wasn't able to live that out. Um, now this is gonna be very difficult and not too many people have seen this, but the, a couple of days before the sentence hearing, which was in September of 2014, I got a letter from Andrew's parents. And I just wanted to share this with you. <clears throat> um, and I will try to do the best I can. So um, I'm gonna start out by saying, I just wanted to write you a letter because you know, we're probably not gonna get a much of, of a chance to talk at the hearing. And in fact, after the hearing, everybody was in such a state of shock, we just stood there in a room together staring at the walls before they whisked us out the back door so we could run to our cars and avoid the media. Uh, so we really didn't get much of a chance to talk. Uh, but that's why his mom was writing me this letter. Um, and he was just thanking me for the letter that I'd wrote. And I just want you to understand this last few sentences here that Drew Andrew was, was quite the Purdue cheerleader. He didn't leave the house unless he was wearing the school logos in some form. He wanted people to ask him about Purdue and was excited to describe what a great school he thought it was. Okay. And of course, his parents thought it was exactly where he was meant to be. Um, and uh, as you, many of you probably know, uh, in his honor, I've created an undergraduate teaching award. There had not been a uh, an award to recognize outstanding undergraduate TAs previously. And actually had been on the back of my mind and said, you know, I've had a lot of TAs and a lot of them have done a really good job and I really don't have a way to recognize them. So this uh, either fortunately or unfortunately provided uh, the opportunity to do that. Uh, a really good friend of his and mine now, Steve Carlson, who's also in senior design when he took it, uh, actually created a printed circuit board that is shown over there with Drew's likeness on it. And we handed those out at the graduation ceremony in um, uh, spring of 2014. Okay? And so I created the, a plaque for the teaching award. Uh, and of course, in my, uh, my uh, tribute to him, I told him that, told his parents that he, the namesake of the award would be the first recipient. So, um, uh, we, we shipped that to them over the summer, last summer. Uh, and um, so, um, and then uh, went on to say that, uh, yeah, he was, he was doing uh, what he loved. And clearly he loved what he was doing. He loved being at Purdue, he loved being a student, he loved being a TA, he was just full of life. And you know, the fact that they're not ready to say good, goodbye and, and hopefully they'll be able to come to campus uh, this spring, maybe, and uh, when we give out the first award to other recipients, I, I hope that they can come and witness that. Uh, and then just thinking back to what happened in the classroom. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of misinformation in the press, unfortunately, they talk about a crowded classroom. Well, this is one of the labs, okay? So it's crowded because there are benches there. There were only maybe 12 or 13 students in there at the time. We had two staff, well, actually, we had three staff. Had an instrument room support student and then the two TAs. So, and ironically, these labs had key lock doors, so you had to enter a code to get in. It turns out that, uh, the way Cody got the code to get in is he signed up for 362 in the first week he had the code to get into the lab to commit a crime. So we had all kinds of security stuff in place and it all went for naught. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, Pat Harrington uh, paid us a compliment in terms of the support that we were able to offer students. And then just letting, uh, letting me know they were praying for us and um, just trying to accept what they can't change. Uh, so, and trying to move forward. Uh, so that was a very touching letter. And then the absolute hardest thing was the hardest thing in my life, worst day of my life, uh, September 19th at the sentence hearing. <clears throat> uh, I had just been contacted just, I think only about a, a week prior to that that uh, from uh, Pat Harrington asking me to, um, to uh, testify at that hearing. 
and I was hoping against hope that I could just write a statement and submit it uh, because I knew it was going to be very, very, very difficult. And you can see my hand scratch notes on his email he sent to me about the potential questions. But then he said, this isn't a test, so please don't over-prepare. You know, I guess he knew me too well at that point. Um, so um, this was very, very, very difficult. And uh, I didn't know any other way. I, I was just, during the hearing, I was writing down things that were said. Some of these came out in the press. Uh, some of them didn't. I think you've all heard the one, I killed him because I wanted to, that he said he's glad that he's dead. I didn't like the way he looked or talked. I'm proud of what I did. It was as easy as it possibly could have been, despite all the security that we had in place. Uh, and initially he tried to feign uh, insanity. Then he confessed at the end that he made it all up, uh, that he really was not insane. And um, just a statement, uh, the one semi-nice thing he said was, uh, you know, saying his mother was a good uh, psychological technician but didn't understand his case, he wanted to treat him like an invalid, someone that needed mental treatment instead of the liar, drug abuser, and murderer that he was. Okay. Most chilling thing that I found out in the course of that was that uh, Cody had a list of 10 people he wanted to wipe out. Uh, Andrew was the first one. I can only imagine where uh, I was on that list because I'd flunked him in 270 a few semesters earlier. Uh, and then some other statements, I mean, just so no remorse at all, uh, anywhere at any time. Um, and other statements that were made, uh, his math teacher from high school, who was a Purdue graduate herself, she was the one that had encouraged Andrew to attend Purdue and she was lamenting that. And she testified right before I came to the stand and that was, I was all choked up about that and had to come up and testify about things related to the course. My testimony was actually turned out to be rather mundane comparatively. Um, Andrew's mom gave a, an amazing testimony. Um, and, uh, but the most heart-wrenching thing was is that Drew had, been so mutilated by the uh, stab wounds that she didn't even have a hand to hold. Um, Pat Harrington told me offline that there are only two or three other individuals I have prosecuted through my entire career who I believe would go out and do it again once they got out of prison. And that's why the specter of a reduced sentence really scared a lot of us uh, because he would just go out and continue down his list. Um, controversy over this, but one of the uh, psychiatrists that testified said that mental illness didn't play a role in the crime. The coroner said that it's the worst homicide out of about 10,000, this is a fairly old elderly man, that he's ever seen. The worst homicide that he's ever seen. And this happened in the lab that I grew up in, okay. but. Um, I have an awful lot of respect, not only for Pat Harrington, but also for the judge, Tom Bush. Um, he nailed it exactly, and he basically came to the conclusion I did just a couple of weeks earlier, uh, as I was doing some reading, and he just said, and this got a little bit of press, but not a lot, but he just came out and said, when he was ready to hand down his sentence, that this is the story of Cain and Abel. It's a crime of hatred and terror is what Cody did is he went into that lab and terrorized all those students. He taunted them. So after he shot Andrew and before he stabbed him to death uh, and mutilated him, he just said, oh, you can call the police now. I don't have any more bullets. I'm not gonna hurt anybody else. And proceeded to kick him violently and go on from there. So um, I, I so much appreciate my dear wife sitting there with me through this and my younger son, Connor, I hated that he had to hear all this, uh, but it was, that was the hardest day of my life. And then going back to Mary's letter, uh, she had this little poem at the bottom. So, it's no farewell words were spoken, no time to say goodbye. You were gone before we knew it. Only God knows why. 
Hearts still ache, secret tears flow. What it meant to love you, no one could ever know. Since you'll never be forgotten, we pledge to you today, a hallowed place within our hearts. It's where you'll always stay. Oh, well, let me wrap this up. Uh, I heard a good quote the other week or two ago, I think pretty much sums it up. Living without hope, without grace, without faith, it's, it's like running a race without a finish line. You may recall that the uh, tagline on the title was walking through the, my journey through the valley of the shadow of death. Many will recognize that as Psalm 23, but thankfully it doesn't end there, does it? What does it say next? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will fear no evil, okay? And remarkably, after all this, I'm no longer afraid. You would think I'd be looking around each corner when I go around knowing why I was on the top 10 list, but I don't fear evil. And why don't we fear evil? For you're with me. And how's this psalm in? Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. All right, I just want to wrap up by thanking some very special people. And I actually created a cheat sheet here, but most of them are sitting back there, so I <laughs> if you're not here, I guess it doesn't matter. But my dear wife who sat with me and helped me and supported me all through this, and my sons Corbin and Connor prayed for me continually, our pastor faith church that uh, really provided some wonderful counseling. Um, and then we had this problem after two labs got destroyed basically because they were joined at the hip. We had to move both 270 and 362 lab, which 350 students we had to move to a new location within days, okay. And some remarkable people stepped forward and they're all sitting back there Barrett, Matthew, Dave Asbell, Joe Boer, Mark Johnson, Todd Wild, uh, anybody I'm leaving off, guys? And uh, a, a, whole a whole bunch of students, a, a, an army of students that were pulling wires. I guess even at times we had more students than we could imagine needing. And even people volunteering to take the positions that were vacated. Uh, for the UTA positions that were vacated. Um, so, um, uh, Mike Mellick, Ragu helped me quite a bit. Um, the business office people, um, the uh, undergrad office staff, um, lots and lots of people. Uh, and I just got an outpouring of emails from all over, all over the place. They saw my memorial statement and uh, we're offering comments on that. Um, so special thanks to all those people. And then the students put together a poster for me that they signed, I've got it up here. But uh, I was really touched by all those comments that students had made. And then this is my last slide, so we're good. There's just one more thing I wanna say. So um, uh, one thing that I'm very pleased with is that uh, the uh, the ECE Student Association, uh, Student Society, I should say, ECESS, uh, has uh, voluntarily taken over the ECE Design Showcase, and they've renamed it the Spark Challenge. Those of you who are into puns get the idea of bolt and spark. That's it's meant to be that way. And so um, this new Spark Challenge, which is uh, a uh, showcase on steroids that Todd Wild is heading up, I have to give you credit for that, um, will uh, be a broader, uh, cover a broader range of participants. Um, and uh, at that event, I will be presenting the Undergraduate Teaching Award for this year. Uh, the only problem is I've got five or six worthy recipients at least, and I try, need to try to narrow it down within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then the award plaque. I just want to encourage that anybody that has influence or 
the knowledge of how to do it is, I would just, I've just been struggling. The one, one last hard thing to do is to try to figure out an appropriate way to honor this young man and his family for the sacrifice that they made, okay? I don't know what that would be. I mean, we have some token things here that we're doing, uh, but I would certainly appreciate any suggestions that people might have. And so that's it. So I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Okay, well, if there are no questions, there looks like there's some goodies over there. I'll be happy to talk with you offline if uh, that would be appropriate. So thank you so much for coming today and for your attention. Um, like I said, this is very difficult for me to do. Um, part of it's just therapy, trying to maybe provide me some closure in uh, putting all these different pieces together. So thank you very much. <laughs>